good. Very good. It's uh, it's it from. Uh, time, Amanda? Will you sorry. Hold, will you hold it up for more time? Yeah. It's called Patria. It's from uh, Portugal, the, the Alentejo region. It's uh, quite nice. Nice. So, uh, very important like question, Fernanda. Mm. Are liquor stores open in Sao Paulo? Yes, they are considered essential business. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so, so we, we had our liquor stores closed for a long time in, in Pennsylvania, but they're oh, really, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. And then uh, like two months, I think they were closed. And then they went to, uh, you could call and get pickup at the storefront. And mm -hmm. now I think most of them are open again, but uh -huh. um, I'm not sure if they are in the city of Philadelphia. No. Okay. No. In the but suburbs, how, they are. How are the, the regulations about it? Because, uh, 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 you know, in Brazil, you can buy... Uh, um, beverage, you know, alcohol uh, in the supermarket, so it's uh, it's uh, easy to to get. But I don't know the regulations in Philadelphia how or in Pennsylvania how they work. So Pennsylvania has a state liquor store, so okay. they um, they control it through the state. And you, there are certain grocery stores where you can buy wine or mm -hmm. uh, beer but very mm -hmm. limited. Okay. Um, beer stores never closed. They were determined to be essential services. Okay. <laughs> but uh, wine and liquor stores did close. So uh -huh. that's why it's very exciting for me to have my cocktail now. <laughs> I'm so excited, oh, but I won't ruin what you're drinking, Anna, but it is named after the state I'm from where you can buy yeah. bourbon and gas stations. So moving to Pennsylvania has been hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> Not. It's a cultural difference. <laughs> and Pennsylvania is one of like has some of the strictest liquor laws of any of the states. Yeah. There's a lot of oh, wonderful yeah. things about our Quaker heritage, and mm -hmm. that is one that's a little rough, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I see uh, Tia has joined us. Um, Hi. Are you there? She's there. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, Tia. Are you joining Hi. us from... Oh, there you are! Yay! Oh, great to see you. So no good to oh, see you. I miss you. Oh. <laughs> so, everyone, uh, Tia is uh, my former curatorial assistant. And uh, Tia is actually from Brazil, uh, but she now lives... You're in Brooklyn right now, right? Yeah, I'm in Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah. I'm living in Brooklyn because I'm doing my PhD at, at CUNY, at the Graduate Center. <laughs> and so uh, Tia worked with me to help bring a group of scholars from Mexico and Brazil to the United States a few years ago. And uh, also Alba is on the phone call and she also helped with that project. So uh, it's great to see her. She's got a very glamorous shot of mm -hmm. her uh, right now. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Wanted to say hi to Ruth. I see Ruth Fine on the call. Hi, how are you? You nice again? To see you, Ruth. Good to see you. Good to Hello. see you too. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. I missed Hello. out on my trip to Brazil last year, unfortunately, so I've never been. Oh. And I was supposed to go when they had the um, conference on Hater and uh, in Sao Paulo. On okay. Bruce Prince and the American Prince. The relationship between the Okay, yes. Uh -huh. making populations. I think it was um, Rockefeller who gave the prince to Brazil. Yes, yes. So, uh -huh. yeah. uh, I attended that conference. It was yeah. great. Yeah, uh, it was great. Somebody read a paper I wrote, but... Um, okay. Yeah. You can... Were you, you sick then, come. Ruth? Is that why you couldn't go? Uh, I was worried. I was okay. right before I was supposed to go to Ireland, which of course in the end I only could be there for a week. So um, yeah, I wish I'd gone to Brazil because <laughs> <laughs> I could have stayed in Brazil for as long as I was supposed to. You know, it was one of yeah. those Era Foundation uh, oh, wonderful yeah. catalog. So I do have that. Anyway, another time. Well, another Ruth time. You should come. Yeah, yeah, now you're friends with Fernanda, and she is a very good tour guide. 
All right, I will, I will accept your invitation as soon as we can get out of our apartments, which is- Yes, nice. yes. <laughs> Hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. we're, doing, uh, we're doing a great project, hopefully next year, uh, again with the Terra Foundation uh, mm -hmm. on American art. It's like, it's, it's, it will be a big ex exhibition on American art, but uh, not the American art that you are, you know, that, that like the general public is, uh, you know, uh, more comfortable of seeing. It's mm -hmm. gonna be a show uh, that uh, goes from 1913 until 83. But the whole idea is to stress, um, uh, less known uh, works and artists. How so great. it's going to be very beautiful. Who's yeah. working on it from the Terra? Is PJ working uh, on PJ it? PJ working, mm -hmm. yeah. PJ okay. is working from the Terra. And Taylor. Oh, okay, change. Okay, somebody wants to say hello before we get started. Look, <laughs> it's Tia. It's Tia. Are you going to be shy? <laughs> How are you? Hi, Gabriel. Come on. Show oh. your face. Oh, come on. Uh, hello. I'm glad to be here. It's Mary Frances. Hi, Mary Frances. Thanks for joining us. Oh, you don't have my picture, do you? Oh. Let me get it. I'm going to get Gabe uh, out of the room. And then we're going to get started. And we'll get started. How do I do my make my video work? Share screen? Um, no, so hold on one second. I'm going to ask you to start your video and you can click yes. There we go. Oh, okay. Wonderful. So we're going to get started okay. with a great transition because I'm going to give a quick Zoom tutorial before we get going. Um, but first, I want to say welcome, everyone. It's so, so good to see all of you. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Abby King, the Assistant Director of Adult Programming here at PAPA. Um, and I want to start off today, like I start most of our events, thanking our members. Um, thank you to all the PAPA members on this call for helping us keep PAPA strong and for being here with us. And cheers, everyone, to another PAPA Pours. I don't know about you, but I love seeing what beverages people have. I know Anna and Fernando are going to talk about that a little later. But so cheers, and thanks for being here with us. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. So just a quick Zoom some Zoom overview of how we're gonna organize this today. I've gone ahead and muted everybody. This is not, this does not mean that we don't wanna hear from you. We really do. Um, I am gonna ask though that you utilize while Anna and Fernanda are beginning the talk there, they have some lovely images to share with all of you that you do stay muted for that, but that you can use our chat to ask questions, um, send links, drop things in. I'm gonna start that here. We've already got this one comment. Um, as well as drop just a quick link to our membership as I thanked them. Um, but feel free to utilize the chat as we go through. Um, the other things are, the, the reason I ask you to mute is that mute, Zoom loves to assume it knows who the speaker is. So even if you're, you think you're being quiet, um, a cat might come in um, and it'll zoom over to you. So we're gonna ask that unless you're actively speaking that you stay on mute. We will have a conversational part of the um, event where we'll ask you if you want to ask questions by unmuting yourself, we'll just ask you to raise your hand with the participant button. So if you go down to the bottom of your screen, it says participants. If you click on that on the right hand side, it'll say raise hand. Um, if all else fails, just drop in the chat. I want to ask a question or, or wave us down, but if you can try that option first, we'd appreciate it um, since we do have quite a few people on the call. A few other quick housekeeping things. We are recording today's event. Um, so if you'd like to not be on the recording, you can mute your screen. So at the bottom of your screen, if you're on a computer, next to that little mute button is your camera button. You can click that on and off and you won't be on the recording. Um, but and I'll, I also mentioned that if you can't see yourself on here, you're welcome to click that button. That should solve that as well. I will mention, unless you're actively speaking or asking a question, you're not necessarily going to be on the recording. It's really only our speakers. Um, and we will share that on our YouTube channel in a few days. So if you know anybody who wanted to be on the call and couldn't be, feel free to point them in that direction as well. And I'll drop a link in a second to that. Um, other than that, I'm sure I'm missing something. Oh, um, Zoom recently updated, so views are a little bit different. Um, where they're still the same too, but they might look a little different. So if I'm the, the big head at the bottom of your screen, you're in speaker mode. I'd recommend for the beginning portion of the event that you stay in speaker mode so you can see Anna, you can see Fernanda, um, 
But then once we switch into more conversation, if you want to go to the right hand side of your screen where it says gallery view, that way you can see everybody and what I think of as the Brady Bunch view. So right now I can see quite a few of you all lined up on my screen. Um, other than that, I'm going to now turn it over to the Curator of Historical American Art, Dr. Anna O'Marley, who's going to introduce our very special guest tonight. Um, but thank you all for being here and thanks Anna and Fernando. All right, uh, thank you all for being here. And um, I'm going to uh, tell you what I'm drinking, which I always do at the beginning of Path of Pours. Um, so I was going to make a caipareña, which is the national drink of Brazil, but I don't have any cachaça with me. The last, uh, Tia, who is on this call, brought me some the last time she went to Brazil. And I'm afraid I have not been to Brazil for about two years now, so I'm out. Um, so instead I made a Kentucky Mule, which is another drink of the Americas, and uh, that's in honor of Abby, um, who is from Kentucky. So cheers to you and your family today, Abby. Thank you, Anna. Cheers. All right, so um, I'm going to uh, introduce Fernanda, and uh, I think I'll share my screen and get started with our PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to introduce Fernanda, tell you how we met and how this Brazilian curator and this curator from Philadelphia became colleagues and started working together. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the connections between 19th century art in Brazil and Philadelphia, the really strong connections you never knew about. And uh, then we're going to talk about um, some art being made today. And we'll turn it over to Fernanda to tell you a little bit about the Pinacoteca where she works in Sao Paulo. And uh, then at the end of her spiel, she's going to talk a little bit about what the post COVID reality is for the arts in Brazil. And I don't know if some of you saw, um, there was a news feature, I think it was in the Guardian yesterday that um, num that Brazil is now number two in the world in cases of COVID. And guess who is number one? Go America, the United States, America first. So we have a lot in common, just like we did in the 19th century. And so maybe we'll talk a little bit about that too. So let's uh, get the PowerPoint shared and I will share the images and introduce you to Fernanda. Okay, so um, here we have uh, Path of Pores, American Art Across Hemispheres. And my special guest tonight is uh, Fernanda Pita, who is a senior curator at the Pinacoteca de Sao Paulo and lecturer of art history at FAAP Sao Paulo. I'll, I'll let her say what that university is when she talks. Um, she holds a PhD in art history from the University of Sao Paulo. And her research interests focus on discussions of national art paradigms in a transnational context. So like myself, she is really interested in connecting um, art across uh, hemispheres. So across uh, South America and North America and Central America, as well as connections between Europe and South America. So currently, in addition to collaborating with the curator Nain Terena in Veoxa, I don't know how to pronounce Portuguese very well, um, uh, who is the first, in, uh, it's the first exhibition of indigenous contemporary art to be held in the Pinacoteca, scheduled to open this fall, it's very exciting. She's also working on an exhibition um, that is going to be opening in Belgium on colonialism, war, and fear in current times. So I think just there that gives you sort of the idea of the breadth of Fernanda. We've worked on 19th century art, she's also working on contemporary art, and she's working with Europe. Um, so, oh, let's see there. That's how I make it go forward. Okay. So, um, how did Fernanda and I meet? Uh, so, um, I was lucky to, uh, be able to attend a conference in, in Rio de Janeiro a number of years ago about academies, uh, throughout the, uh, world. Um, it was held in celebration of um, the Academy de Bellas Artes in Rio de Janeiro. And um, I 
was one of a few invited speakers from the United States. Uh, I had been really interested in the connections between um, history painting in particular in the United States and Mexico. And I really uh, didn't know anything about Brazilian art. It was my first trip to Brazil. Um, you know, there are virtually no art history textbooks that reproduce Brazilian art uh, available in the United States. Uh, it's very even hard to find uh, textbooks of Mexican 19th century art in the United States. So the only way to see this art is to go, uh, to go to Mexico City, to go to Rio, to go to Sao Paulo and to meet the curators. Um, and uh, see the art in person and make the connections. And uh, the Terra Foundation has made that possible uh, for many scholars uh, of the United States to travel, to meet their colleagues in Central and South America. Um, and that is how I got there. Um, then, so uh, I was introduced to Fernanda at this conference in Rio and we immediately discovered our mutual love of 19th century painting. Uh, and uh, we started plotting. And then there was another opportunity that was made available um, between the Terra Foundation and the Association of Art Museum Curators. They established an international engagement program for international curators. And so I had met Fernanda and said, Let, we should apply for this, we can work together. Um, and we were one of, I think, the first three pairs of curators. And yes. it enabled Fernanda to come to Philadelphia and learn uh, about the US museum world. It also enabled us to do partnerships. And also at the same time, we were able to secure a wonderful uh, grant from the NEH to have this convening of scholars uh, that I mentioned, uh, my colleague Tia, who's on the phone call, Alba, and also my colleague Natalia Vieira. Um, we organized this group of scholars and you can see them standing in that photo uh, on the stair, uh, wonderful. I, I think back about that time that we all got together just so often um, colleagues from from Brazil, from Mexico and the US and the discussions we had, which just continue to resonate today. Um, and uh, the, the images we're showing you here are one from PAFA's collection and then one from the Museo Nacional de Bellas Artes, right, in, in, um, in, in Rio. And Fernanda, I wonder if you could talk about uh, how you were struck by this painting, Pat Lyon at the Forge, when you came to visit Philadelphia for the first time. Yeah, yeah thank you, Anna. Thank you very much for uh, having me with you in Puffa Pores. I uh, wish to thank Abby for uh, her support and, uh, you know, um, explaining how, how this program works. Uh, and um, of course, uh, this could not be possible without the Tara Foundation and AMC uh, uh, Foundation who uh, granted us this incredible fellowship uh, and uh, let us be part of this program and uh, be together uh, thinking and researching um, the history, the art history uh, uh, from the United States, Mexico and Brazil. So, um, um, I uh, met Anna in this uh, lovely uh, gathering, this lovely conference on the, the history of uh, the academies. And it was the moment when the Brazilian Academy was uh, celebrating its uh, 200th uh, birthday. So it's very old as you will see in a while. And uh, as we were exploring uh, the history of the academies uh, and also the history of the kind of work that those academies were uh, supposed to teach and promote and uh, uh, exhibit, we uh, started to, to find many connections and many um, common ground to uh, yes, I can see them now. Yeah, it's come ground uh, to think about uh, the relationship between 
uh, our different, uh, you know, contexts and histories. Uh, when I uh, when I first saw off, Anna was the one who, uh, after I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, Anna. After you saw this painting, it, can you show the other uh, slide? Yeah. When you saw this painting by uh, Almeida Junior at the collection at the Museum Nacional uh, of uh, Fine Arts in, in Rio, the National Museum of Fine Arts in Rio, you and we started talking about this painting and how it uh, is the first um, depiction of a worker, of a free worker, of a, uh, of a worker who uh, is working with his hands and uh, on, uh, you know, uh, a natural landscape. And we started uh, talking about how difficult this history of work and uh, free labor and uh, common people is uh, for the US as well as Brazil with the slavery history that we uh, commonly uh, unfortunately share. Uh, you pointed me to John Nagel's uh, Pet Lion at the Forge, which of course is a different uh, construction of an image of a free man or free worker and it's a white man but uh, that is proud of is proud of his um, you know simple origins and of his labor of his um, uh, of his labor of his uh, uh, you know uh, what he knows to do with his own hands and at that, uh, you know, when we started to figuring out those connections and those possibilities of thinking comparatively, but not uh, homogenizing the histories that we have, but stressing uh, points that we were not aware or not thinking through uh, very clearly uh, by looking at this more broad uh, scenario, more broad history, we started making those connections and I think that's very enriching and it gives us new perspective and uh, renew of our understanding of our past and our history and our, our you know, common uh, experiences. Yeah, I think you're completely right because, you know, there are these paintings like Pat Lyon at the Forge are quite iconic in, in the United States or in knowledge of American art. This painting hangs next to our paintings of our presidents. Um, but it is so important because it show, it's a huge grand manner portraiture that shows a man uh, with humble origins, it's a blacksmith, which is something that you would not have seen in Europe, but is a sort of a development that is happening in academies in the Americas. And um, in this slide here, I wanted to show you uh, the three um, uh, academies that Fernanda and I have focused most on in our project, which is Mexico City, the Academy San Carlos, which is actually the oldest academy in the Americas, founded in 1781, PAFA, founded in, 17, in 1805, and the uh, Academy in Rio, which was founded in 1816. And here to give you if just a few examples, um, I had long been interested in this painting uh, by Peter Frederick Rothermill in our collection that is by a Philadelphian, by the director of our academy, but that depicted a Spanish colonial uh, conquistador, um, a religious scene. And so I was really struck when I visited uh, Rio and I saw uh, the painting uh, by Pedro Perez of the Elevation of the Cross. Um, and when I gave my talk in, in Rio, uh, there was a whole group of um, uh, scholars from Central and South America who said, oh, these paintings are everywhere. So this, this Catholic imagery is not something that's necessarily everywhere in the United States. So I began to think about how, how was there this, this sort of very large uh, colonial language? Uh, that's something that we were talking about. And 
actually this painting, the Primera Mesa, uh, actually came to Philadelphia in 1876. It was at the Centennial Exhibition. So that was one of the surprising things that we discovered. Uh, the, uh, the, it was it the Emperor Don, Don Pedro came to Philadelphia the for the Centennial, yeah. right. Um, and he and uh, Grant actually started the cordless engine engine together at the, the fair. It's amazing all these connections. Um, so another uh, work that um, Fernanda drew my attention to uh, was the painting of Moema. Um, now, uh, I had seen uh, the Gutierrez painting uh, in Mexico City, and I was very aware of our uh, John Vanderland painting, which was the first nude ever exhibited in a museum in the United States. And all three of these paintings uh, were actually painted in Paris. So uh, an American, a Brazilian, and a Mexican artist were all influenced by Cabanel, the birth of Venus, I'm showing you, and Cabanel in turn was inf influenced by Giorgione. And, but what's interesting, what, something that Fernanda and I were interested in exploring is how uh, in the Americas, in these academies, in particular academic art, uh, the form of the scene of Venus was adapted for a colonial or imperial uh, trajectory of a national identity in, in these nascent countries. Yeah. the same imagery used in each country. Yeah, and I, uh, I just would like to point out also the how the indigenous female body plays a role in this, uh, you know, portrait of, uh, of uh, the nude, the, the, the female nude, and how uh, it was uh, sort of um, Trans, a translation to uh, local and uh, uh, particular uh, context of this re repertoire of French uh, painting that shifts the meaning and the understanding of those uh, of those models. That's uh, something that uh, we were we are uh, still very interested in um, how it plays different. Um, meanings in different contexts. Yeah, I agree, Fernanda. And I think, you know, often in the United States, this our Ariadne painting is seen as so exceptional, like part of American exceptionalism and American identity. But when you put it in this context, it completely changes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, US audiences may be familiar with Thomas Hovenden's The Last Moments of John Brown. Uh, John Brown led a major uh, revolt um, leading up to the Civil War at Harper's Ferry. Um, and this painting was done by Thomas Hovenden, who was a teacher at PAFA, and he was also Henry Osawa Tanner's teacher. Um, but I was really struck uh, when I saw this painting in Brazil of Ham's Redemption, which is a very complicated painting, which may be when we talk about the contemporary work that you recently purchased, we could talk a little bit about that, Fernanda. Uh, but it struck me that we don't often talk about, we talk a lot about race relations in the United States and the legacy of slavery, but we don't connect it to Brazil's or other countries' complicated relationships with slavery. And I think there's a benefit to thinking about these systems of oppression and visuality across nations. Um, and I'm showing you here uh, a, uh, a Native American First Nations artist and a Shabi artist, Rebecca Belmore, who it, uh, my colleagues at the Peabody Essex Museum drew, drew my attention to this work, which is an artist literally turning her back on um, these kind of representations uh, like Moema and like Ariadne of uh, women, uh, you know, native women who are, are in, uh, allegories of the state who have been usually sexually assaulted. 
Um, and when you think about the large levels of violence and sexual assault against First Nations communities in the United States and Canada, um, I think Rebecca Belmore's work Fringe, which is a suggestion of sort of bloody beating, um, and then this parallel of the white cloth, but then turning away, is a remarkable example of a contemporary artist who is taking the language of history painting and refashioning it for her own purposes. Um, and then Fernanda, uh, I wanted to turn it over to you now and, and have you talk about this work, Atlantico, that you recently, your institution recently purchased. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, and I think uh, those three images speak a lot and uh, how um, uh, the legacy of slavery and, and the, the struggle of enslaved uh, people and their descendants still resonates uh, very profoundly in our countries. And uh, uh, it's interesting to see how uh, the US and Brazil respond to um, this heritage, this horrible heritage in different ways, and also how uh, it was uh, the slavery and slavery uh, institution was uh, uh, addressed in different uh, manners in the US and Brazil. Um, this painting that you see on the, on, on the right side of the, of the slide that is almost offensive for our perspective, our uh, current perspective, was something that was very praised by the audiences in all spectrum of uh, colors in late 19th century, where you see this uh, old uh, uh, Afro-Brazilian woman praising the, 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 the heavens, that her daughter, might be her daughter, got uh, to have a white child from a white man. And this idea that embodied the, all this very violent process of uh, mixture and uh, miscegenation in Brazil that was understood at, as something that would um, make the, the country join uh, a more uh, civilized or uh, progressive uh, moment. It's uh, almost turned uh, upside down by uh, Arjan Martin's work. Arjan Martin is a painter who works in Rio de Janeiro and he, uh, he's doing uh, this, he's dressing history painting in a very challenging and very creative way when he uh, addresses the issue of the transatlantic uh, trade uh, traffic of people, of human beings through the Atlantic, which connects really uh, the three uh, uh, continents or the three uh, uh, places we, we, we're talking about, Brazil, US, and Africa. And he does it uh, by revolving, kind of revolving images that are taken from uh, history books or from the press. And he's mixing uh, all those images into this composition. And you, you can see, maybe you can see the first uh, at the center of the painting, you have like this child that is uh, he took from a newspaper, and then you have all the symbols of the crown and the the date that marks there is the date of the end of uh, official or legal trade uh, of uh, slave trade, and and how it makes by those circles like this connection and this idea that we have, we share a common history that is horrible and that we still have uh, to address and to compensate and to repair in a way uh, 
in our current times. Thank you, Fernanda. Um, so I've asked Fernanda to, before we uh, switch to conversation, to tell us a little bit about the Pinacoteca and the work she does there, because many people on this chat may not have been to uh, Sao Paulo. Yeah, I just wanted to to talk a little bit and show you a little bit about uh, Pinacoteca, invite you to come as soon as we are allowed to travel and to be together again. And uh, Pinacoteca is located in Sao Paulo's downtown. It's a huge city, if you don't know, we have uh, roughly 12 million people living uh, in the city. And we have this beautiful area um, where uh, uh, we, we have our main building which is a historical building I'll be talking a little bit soon. And also a park that surrounds it and a train station nearby and subway station. So we are very well placed in the city. Although it's a very challenging neighborhood, it's very uh, central, it's in, uh, very you know, uh, easy to get. Oh, somebody is asking if those are solar, solar uh, panels or skylight. They're, they're skylight. We have this beautiful skylight because this, beautiful, this building was built to be the school of art, arts and crafts. Firstly, it was um, the school of arts and crafts. So they were very aware of the necessity of lighting. And also uh, at first we had all the, the upper uh, floor galleries uh, illuminated by natural light. Nowadays, we don't have it because of uh, questions of uh, climate and uh, the security of the, the works, but it used to be like that. So this is the main building and uh, it was uh, made in the late 19th century uh, to install the, the School of Arts and Crafts. And when Pinacoteca was found in 1905, it it was installed in this uh, left uh, upper uh, windows that you see there, only one room. And now uh, we have it all, the all building is ours. We have this main building and then we have a second facility, which is called Estação Pinacoteca, like Pinacoteca Station. And we have there our offices and also exhibition spaces like the fourth floor. It's a very beautiful, uh, open uh, space for mostly we do contemporary uh, exhibitions or solo uh, mid-career shows there. And then we also have our library there and we have this very interesting project with this, the Resistance Memorial, which is uh, because this building was occupied by the, um, the, the police during dictatorship. So many political prisoners were there and they were uh, tortured and they were killed. And so we keep the memory of the building, which is a very heavy and difficult memory uh, with several educational pro projects that we do there. And we are also planning to have a third facility to be open hopefully in 2022 that will be uh, exclu exclusively um, uh, to contemporary art. And that, uh, that- Sorry, I don't facility... know what happened. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I don't know what happened. Uh, don't worry. And uh, it's a uh, school, like a modernist school, school, as you can see by the, by the photo, that will be renovated and adapted to um, to our collection of contemporary art because we have uh, 10,000 uh, works collection right now and we're still spending, we need more space to show our uh, collection. Um, okay, good. Sorry. There you go, <laughs> thank you. Well, Pinacoteca is a museum of Brazilian art and um, as we understood, uh, our mission is to be like addressing the art of the present. And so we have a historical collection, but we also do collect uh, contemporary art and we do have a very special place for contemporary art, art in our program and in all our activities. As you can see, this uh, photo there is an opening performance with Colectivo Legitima Defesa 
that we did uh, last year in this exhibition that I co-curated with Johan Volt that was called We Are Many Experiments in Collectivity, where we had this uh, structure that it's a, it's a work by Hercrit Siravanija, the Thai uh, artist. Um, and he, uh, the only thing that he uh, says that uh, this stage should be open to anyone, to everyone who wants to, you know, occupy this space and perform there. So we had like many uh, activities there. It was a beautiful project that we did. So we have this collection that is uh, from historical art to contemporary art, roughly 10,000 uh, pieces we have now. And uh, we do roughly 10 to 15 exhibitions a year and like small exhibitions and big exhibitions, collective ex exhibitions, solo exhibitions. Uh, and we also have like a very strong and uh, educational program and a very uh, strong uh, uh, public program of conferences, seminars, art history courses. And uh, we are partners with many institutions and we've been working together um, with international museums for a long time and doing travel shows and so on and hopefully uh, we can resume doing that after this very difficult moment we are living in. Uh, can, can you go back one? Thank you. Uh, this is just a photo of one of our rooms uh, where we hang the, the permanent collection. Uh, it's the history in uh, painting side of the room and you can see like this uh, students attending uh, uh, a visit, a guided visit to, uh, to the collection. And it, you can explore our uh, collection through uh, our uh, online uh, collection in the project in the Google Arts and Culture project that we don't have it uh, inside our uh, website but uh, we roughly 500 works are uh, online through the Google project and also uh, I, bu I put a link there to this virtual tour we have uh, in the museum. You can go to the Currently, we are, uh, our main project for 2020 is the new hanging of the permanent collection and I'm giving you a pic, just a, like a, a small uh, uh, view of one of the rooms that is dedicated to art and um, to the work of the artist and, the, and, the, and the, all that is uh, related to the uh, the training and the exercise of, of art uh, by the artists and we are expecting to uh, be able to open it in end of August or as beginning of September. Uh, well, uh, at last I would like to share just for us to, to address this situation, the losses and the the lives that we are losing uh, during this uh, horrible uh, pandemic and talk about and hear you also about the cultural impact of it. In Brazil, uh, we are uh, all museums and cultural centers, movie theaters, concert halls and galleries are closed. We are five, uh, phase five of reopening. At the end of August, uh, like, the more optimistic uh, expectations is at the end of August to be reopening. But we still don't know if this is gonna be like that. We also facing like cuts, uh, very severe cuts in funding. Uh, Pinacoteca is funded partly by the state of Sao Paulo and also uh, by private uh, investors and private um, donations. And we had cuts in salaries, we had cuts uh, in budgets, but uh, we are still able to secure every personnel, every job that we have. So we are lucky at this moment. Uh, the losses that 
people are um, projecting for the cultural sector in the in Sao Paulo is like a very uh, big part of Sao Paulo's economy is uh, the cultural uh, creative industry. So it's going to be huge. And uh, what we have as initiatives are credit lines, emergency open calls that SESC is doing uh, many institutions and foundations that are very strong and have uh, can afford doing that are doing, but we still have to uh, address how how to rebuild all the sector after uh, the impact of COVID. During this time, we are, as I said, we are uh, lucky that we can afford like continue working and we are very uh, engaged in our uh, virtual uh, program that we are doing mostly through Facebook and Instagram, doing campaigns. Uh, one campaign that is called uh, Pina de Casa, Pina from Rome, home, Pinacoteca. Pina is short name for Pinacoteca. And we are doing daily posts in uh, Instagram and Facebook that uh, we curators and the educational department are doing, we are writing. And so every day you have a new work from the collection and also uh, a text that goes um, and talks about the work and gives like uh, some elements for discussion and uh, understanding and uh, knowing uh, those works. We have been doing also live uh, appearances at uh, mostly at, at Instagram, like conversations or um, or uh, interviews. That last uh, Saturday we had Grada Colomba, Quilomba, which is a Portuguese artist from uh, African background. She was discussing the current uh, moment that we are living with Black Matter, uh, Black Lives Matters, and everything in the pro protests around the world. So it was very powerful. And uh, in addition to that, we did an online exhibition, the first time that we show uh, collect our collection of videos and films. And it's the last uh, slide. It is called Distance. It was created by my colleague, Ana Maria Maya, and we are um, granting the, the public to uh, see uh, with the agreement of, of the artist, five videos and films that belong to Pinacoteca's collection. So that's what we've been doing. And hopefully we can get back to our uh, inside activities uh, soon with everybody safe and everybody healthy uh, again in the museum. All right, um, Fernanda, that was amazing. Your your timing was fantastic. Uh, I want to give talks with you all the time on Zoom. Um, so I think, um, Susanna, maybe we'll ask you to help uh, moderate any questions that anybody has. I haven't been able to see the chat because I've been screen sharing, so I don't know what people want to know about or ask about. Um, um, but yeah. So, oh, I see the solar panels was the last one. Yeah, I think that's yeah. the only question so far. So if anyone has things that have been on the, in the back of your mind and you weren't ready to share before. I, I want to ask Anna. Yeah. Something. Okay. Uh, how, how do you, how do you, how do you feel when you saw uh, the redemption of can? How do you how do you relate to that painting? How do you because it's so violent in a way yeah. and so um, so it, it carries a lot of prejudice and this idea that by making uh, you know uh, the the population wider uh, that was uh, you know the solution uh, for the slave problem uh, that uh, as uh, Brazilians spoke at the time. So it's so violent, so um, yeah. uh, 
you know, he cares a lot. Uh, I think uh, it, it was, I was, I, when I first saw it, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Um, mm -hmm. Because it is so, as you said, violent and so race, so explicitly racist. Um, I think one of the things that we've been learning in our current moment in the United States is how good the United States is at pretending it's not racist. And mm -hmm. especially since the civil rights movement trying to hide its racism. So to have a painting like that, that is in the Brazilian National Museum, I was like, this would never happen in the United States. This would never be in the National Gallery in the United States. It might be in the basement, but it would never be on view. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember talking with Tia in particular about if we did the show, if we would bring that painting to the United States. And, and Tia was like, no, <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that I, I wondered is Brazil more honest about their, their legacies or just more brazen, just worse than the United States? Yeah, I don't think, I don't know if it's worse or it's different, like how, how Brazilians address racism in of course, we also have this, and the whole idea of uh, mixing uh, races is what gave the permission to say uh, in a very, uh, you know, lying way uh, that we don't have races, because of course we do have. And, but what, uh, what this whole whitening ideology was uh, uh, able to to masquerade like the idea that uh, by mixing the races the, the whole problem would be solved which is not true you know inequality is still there all the rates that you have in the US about uh, killings and violence and poverty are clearly pointing to the fact that Brazil is a racist country. Actually, that's a great lead in to the question uh, Natalia had, Fernanda, which was, could you talk a little bit more about what the conversation is like in Brazil, Brazilian cultural institutions specifically mm -hmm. related to Black Lives Matter and the moment yeah. we find ourselves in? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, uh, I, I still think, uh, because we've been having like uh, politics and activities that try to address inequality of race and violence and injustice um, for, you know, uh, like trying to look into our collections and see how Black culture is represented, how, uh, in terms of uh, percentage, how many Black or Afro-Brazilian artists are uh, represented and how we can, uh, you know, address this inequality, those inequalities. Uh, specifically, um, this moment now where um, with all the, the, with the, you know, the assassination of George Floyd and, and all the things that, uh, all the things that are happening. Uh, we're seeing some movement, uh, but mostly from the, the, the civil society, from organizations and from more independent groups there, you know, protesting and uh, addressing those questions. Uh, we uh, at Pinacoteca very timely uh, decided to uh, do this talk with, uh, with uh, Grada Quilomba, which we shown uh, her work uh, last year. We did a solo show of her last year and she was in Brazil. We 
we uh, at the moment she was uh, releasing the the translation of her um, book in Brazil, and she's now a very powerful voice in like in the Portuguese uh, language uh, world, and uh, and so uh, we are engaged in the various uh, different kinds of projects for next year. We, uh, for this year, for the, the permanent collection, we are very uh, aware and very, uh, you know, um, engaged, committed to uh, make an imbalance of women artists or of Afro-Brazilian artists in, um, in the whole spectrum of, uh, you know, the culture of those communities in our exhibition. And we are engaged in several projects for the next years that would address invisibility of Black culture in Brazil and uh, the inequality of representation in cultural institutions. So hopefully, we can we can you know be part of this movement and be uh, you know and be uh, fighting against against. Uh, injustice and inequality and uh, violence against Black people and Afro-Brazilian uh, uh, people. Thank you so much, Fernanda. Thank you. How are you, Natalia? Good. It's so nice to see you. And Anna. Nice to see you too. <laughs> so nice to see you, Natalia. I love that both you and Tia are in your kitchens. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. And Fernanda and I are in our like libraries or yeah. living rooms. <laughs> um, living room. Living room. Um, so I think this sort of uh, the, there's a question from Alba where she I think it sort of follows along what you were just saying, but she mm -hmm. says she wants to hear more about you about the rehanging of the main collection. Several major museums of American art have been reinstalled and varying degrees of success. So what is your approach? Oh, thank you, Alba, for, for this uh, question. It, it's been like a very uh, long process and of rethinking and trying to figure it out. What is the moment? What are we, uh, what do you, we need to say and see right now? And uh, the former uh, hanging is a very historical, it like tries to to fill the gap in a way that we don't have in Brazil, a museum that speaks broadly about Brazilian art history and uh, you know, the farmer hanging, the, the whole idea was to present this, this story from colonial times to uh, roughly mid uh, 20th century in a very internal, uh, discussion, like presenting how the academy was founded and how artists were trained and how, uh, what kind of works they were doing and how collections begin to, you know, be established and how uh, all the avant-garde movements uh, appeared and so on and so on. So it was very historical. People say chronological, but I don't like the, the term because we also had it's not like about dates, but it's about problems and about issues and about questions. Uh, but we decided that uh, now we needed to approach the collection differently. So we decided to go for a thematic hanging. So we uh, established two main, uh, you know, themes. One is landscape and terrain and like the, you know, the, uh, uh, the territory, you know, as land and as uh, pertainments and of course as resource. Uh, you might remember the experience of the, uh, the landscape uh, exhibition. So it gave a little input uh, about it landscape uh, uh, throughout the Americas that um, we did of, uh, with, uh, with the US too. 
And the other part is about the body. So we begin with the body of the artist, the artist working and how, the tools that the artist um, uses as uh, you know, he creates or he or she creates. And then we expand to this whole idea of the body, of otherness and the individual body, collective body, gen, gen, generified body and so on. And, uh, and we are in this moment trying to cross historical work with contemporary work, like to pair and to put them together, which is a very challenging, uh, you know, attitude, a very difficult because we are not trained to do so. We are, you know, at our historians, we, we do like our, uh, chronology, <laughs> but we, uh, we still, uh, we think it's, uh, it's going to be provocative in a way and also uh, more, um, more clear to the public to respond to certain discussions like the discussion of race, gender and sexuality and of, um, you know, ecology and, um, exploitation more clearly that uh, we needed to do that step uh, for for the moment. So hopefully it will work. <laughs> and I think, uh, yeah, it's a challenge. It's, uh, it's, it, it's going to be quite radical. Um, but I think it's, it will give us the chance to, uh, to propose some discussions that we are willing and uh, we, we feel that the, the, the audiences want to see them too and to be part of them too. Fernanda, I see we had a question about what is the place of street art in relation to the museum? And I'm not sure if that person knows about the big like how much street art there is in uh, Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo. Yeah. Uh, maybe they do, but um, maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, we are actually surrounded uh, by street art in our museum. We have this beautiful panel by uh, Daniel Melin just in front. When you go out in the main building, you see this enormous painting in the, in the side of a, of a building because we have those uh, I don't know how you call it in English, when you have this uh, side of the building that is completely, um, you don't have wall windows, you don't have like openings, it's just like a blank mm -hmm. uh, surface. And so many artists are, you know, occupying those spaces uh, with graffiti or, or street art. And uh, of course, uh, it's very hard to collect this kind of work. And it's, mostly it comes when you do a commission or something like that, that you work with an artist or a group that you uh, bring them uh, to the collection, to the museum. But actually uh, we were about to open an exhibition of street art at Pinacoteca. One of the most famous uh, street artists, uh, it's uh, it, their siblings, the, the uh, the siblings is their name. They're very famous everywhere. And uh, Os Gêmeos in Portuguese. And they, they're, uh, they're doing their first retrospective in a Brazilian museum at the Negoteca. And we, we, it was a, quite a challenge for us because of course they do like huge scale works and murals and paintings all all around, everywhere, and ger from Germany to uh, to São Paulo, and um, and they uh, they're showing uh, like their life story mostly, not only their work, but mostly the life story and how they get to be uh, what they are now. And uh, we are selling a few pieces by them by them in the museum, but it's uh, impossible to do like this big uh, murals they they do. Uh, yeah, but 
it's quite a big phenomenon in Sao Paulo and uh, we hopefully we, we expand the discussion on how to incorporate in our collection this kind of work and find creative solutions for that with the artists. Thank you, Fernanda. That's a great answer. And you know, we also have a big collection of public art and uh, mural arts in Philadelphia. So um, that's a, a connection between our two cities. Well, it's uh, 631. Um, and I, I think uh, Abby, on behalf of Abby and I and PAFA, uh, we want to thank you, Fernanda, for taking the time to be with us and to talk to us today. Um, we wish you safety. Um, we, uh, we're thinking of you in Brazil since we're number one and two. And uh, we share some challenges uh, with our political situation right now. And I, I think about you all the time. Um, I miss you. Me too. I look forward to the time when we can all be together again. Me too. Thank you very much, Hannah. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Susanna, and all the, the, the people who are there with us today. And hopefully uh, we can be all together soon. Yeah. Stay safe, everyone. Okay. Bye, everybody. Take care. Take all care. right. Bye. 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 Amanda, it was lovely getting to, getting to work Thank with you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye.